Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. What's going on everybody? It's time for December's edition of Swift News. I skipped November because I took a lot of time off and was traveling for the holidays, but we're back in December. And as always, the links for all the stories you see will be in the GitHub repo you see here, which again, link will be in the description. Let's throw up the rundown and get into the show. To kick things off, Swift Playgrounds 4 has finally launched. What's so special about Swift Playgrounds 4? Well, this is kind of like a uh, mini Xcode. Of course, it's not a replacement for Xcode. I don't think it's trying to be either, but Swift Playgrounds went from more of a toy kind of thing that you see in these screenshots to more of a, again, like a mini Xcode where you can you know, be writing uh, real Swift with real Swift frameworks and Swift UI and, and build mini apps and actually publish apps to the App Store all from your iPad on Swift Playgrounds 4. So that is the new thing. That's the big deal about Swift Playgrounds 4 is that it is kind of like a, a mini Xcode. We'll see if one day there ever is a full-blown Xcode on iPad. I think it'll take a few years to get there if we do. But again, I don't think Swift Playgrounds is trying to be that. I think it's a great learning tool for people just starting out or if you're on the go with your iPad. And if you wanna dive right in, Paul Hudson's got you covered here, how to build your first Swift UI app with Swift Playgrounds. Uh, got a great uh, long video here walking through all that. Paul's really stepped up his YouTube thumbnail game. That's a great thumbnail right there. Uh, love to see it. But anyway, as always, he's got a nice article to accompany it. Um, but if you prefer to watch the video, here you go. You got the YouTube link as well. Next up, we have an article from Alexandra here on Apple's use of Swift in Swift UI in iOS 15. Now, this is a running post that he does every year. In fact, I think I've been featuring this on Swift News since like 2018. At least that's when I started doing Swift News. But anyway, you can check out the methodology on how he finds out which uh, binaries are using Swift and Swift UI, et cetera. You can uh, look through that. But I do want to point out one thing here, right? You should take this analysis with a grain of salt, right? Leave the overall picture to be accurate. The approach has some limitations. Long story short, uh, you know, the data may not be 100% accurate, but if you kind of take a step back and look at the trend, I think that's the big takeaway from these articles. So let's scroll down and see uh, binaries uh, using Swift and Swift UI. And if we come down and take a look, right, in orange is binaries using Swift, blue is Swift UI, just look at the trend. Again, we go back to iOS 8 all the way up to iOS 15. And again, I believe I started covering this either iOS 11 and 12. And back then, the big deal was, okay, Apple's starting to use Swift internally. You know, because even back in iOS 12, Swift was still relatively new. So you could start to see you know, more binaries using Swift. And now you can see it's just really taking off. And then as of iOS 13, you can start to see the Swift UI trend. So again, the author even says it. The numbers may not be 100% accurate. No need to nitpick it. I think you can just see the obvious trend on where Apple is going, which is no surprise. And if you want to dive deeper into this article, uh, it talks about which widely used apps now appear to use Swift UI. We got books, maps, notes, weather, tips, music. You can read it, right? I'm not going to read through the whole article, but you can read through about how we did it, what's there, number of binaries, uh, the, how the programming languages are evolving that Apple uses. Obviously, Objective-C still dominant. It's what Apple was like built on. It's going to be dominant for a very long time. But again, you can start to see Swift and Swift UI uh, starting to gain steam. But if you're into all this nerdy stat stuff, uh, definitely check out this article. Uh, but again, I'm just going to go back to this... Uh, uh, chart here, the trend is very clear. We can see where things are heading. And like I said, it's not really a surprise to many of us. Moving on, we have the App Store Awards and like the best apps and games of 2021. And this is just an article you can scroll real quick, right? You can see the, the uh, you know, the iPhone app of the year, Toka Life World. You can see the app, download it, play with it. Uh, iPad app of the year, LumaFusion. Mac app of the year, Craft. Anyway, all kinds of different categories, TV apps, watch apps, you can scroll through games, obviously. So again, whatever your interests are, I recommend scrolling through this article. You know, if you find an app interesting, it'd be download it, play with it, kind of dissect it as a developer to see what you can implement uh, from these award-winning apps to, you know, your apps, right? You can learn a lot by kind of studying uh, these apps. So again, there's not like a huge article to talk about. It's really just a lot of pictures showing you the apps. But again, I recommend, you know, diving in, taking a look at them and uh, seeing what you can learn from them. But on that note, if you're wondering what the award looks like, uh, Daniel here from Craft, the Mac app of the year, uh, did an unboxing of his award. It looks pretty, uh, pretty solid. Here you go, I'll skip forward a little bit. He's unveiling, there you go. That thing's pretty solid. It's got a, uh, I think it's signed by Tim Cook. I'm real curious how heavy that thing is. If that's just like super solid or maybe it's hollow in the middle. It doesn't look like he's struggling with it. it doesn't appear to be that heavy, but it would still be a nice thing to have on your mantle one day. We'll fast forward a little bit, yeah. Well, he's gonna flip it around to the back. Let's check it out. Eh, there, it kind of looks heavy. 
I bet it is heavy. Knowing Apple, it's probably heavy. But yeah, that'd be really cool to have on your shelf. Next up, got another article from Paul Hudson about writing better code with Swift algorithms. Now, I've featured Swift algorithms before on this show here. It's a repo from Apple, open source, basically just taking a lot of uh, common algorithms. You can see a bunch of them here listed on the left and implementing them into an open source library that's gonna constantly evolve and grow over time with contributions from the community. Uh, so back to the article from Paul here, he basically walks through another uh, video here. Again, great thumbnail. Of course, with Paul, you get the article, like I mentioned before, you can scroll through there, or you can follow along uh, in the video if you want your handheld kind of through uh, examples of all of these algorithms. But like I said, I featured algorithms before, but now here's a great guide for walking through them if you really wanna learn about them. Now, if you're here watching Swift news, learning about the latest and greatest, what's going on in the iOS developer and Swift community, you're probably making great apps or at least striving to make great apps. And I always recommend having a great portfolio or website for your app to go along with that. And that brings me to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to help you get that iOS developer portfolio or website for your app up and running very quickly. Now I know we're developers, we can figure out how to build a website, but that's very time consuming. And remember, there's an opportunity cost to your time. And I don't know about you, I would rather spend my time, you know, building my apps, iterating, you know, making them a lot better than messing around with a custom website, right? And making sure it looks great on all browsers, all screen sizes, you know, all devices. Again, it just takes a lot of time to build and maintain a website. I would rather spend that time building apps. So I recommend letting Squarespace take all of that off your plate. They have tons of beautiful themes, so your website's gonna look great. They handle all the SEO and the analytics for you. So when you're ready to build that iOS developer portfolio or website for your app, go to squarespace.com. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Sean Allen to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Next up, we have how necessary are the programming fundamentals by Bruno Roca. And it's an interesting topic, right? We've all been there. It's been talked about on iOS developer Twitter all the time, like how important are those data structures and algorithm skills, right? The whiteboard interviews you get at all the big companies for iOS developers, right? We've had that debate tons of times. Many iOS developers don't like that that's what we get tested on. And this is a good article kind of showing the other side of things and, and helping you understand the complete picture. Because like I said, we'll go down to these common complaints that we see here. And I recommend reading the whole article. It is a little bit longer, so I'll kind of like jump around. Um, but right here are the common complaints, right? We've seen this all the time. I've even complained about this a ton. So, you know, we're not all immune to it, right? But, you know, the questions don't reflect what the person will actually do on their job. You know, they're not indicative of a person's skill in an iOS developer, right? Like my ability to do some crazy, uh, you know, matrix, you know, 2D array problem doesn't really affect what I do as an iOS developer and building apps, right? So that's that's kind of the, the sentiment that a lot of iOS developers have, right? The questions in general are pointless. Why does an iOS developer need to know how sorting functions work, right? We've all been there. But Bruno here does a great job in this article of breaking down like why these larger companies like the Googles of the world uh, focus on this so much. And I think he really breaks it down um, in this great analogy of becoming a professional musician. It's long, I won't go through it, but I'll kind of get to the highlight points he talks about here. So basically he talks about like, when you're le learning to be a musician, you know, do you just need to learn the notes and the chords for your song? Or do you need to understand like music theory and all that stuff? That's the analogy he uses for programming. Um, and so he says, who really needs to learn the theory? Uh, so this is kind of like the deep computer uh, science skills. And I think these three points really break it down into uh, what you need to do and what you need to learn, right? And essentially, do I want to learn it as a hobby and never going beyond playing on my couch for fun? So this would again be like the hobbyist coder, right? I'm just going to tinker around, build a little app. Cool then you probably don't need all the computer science fundamentals, right? Same thing, do I wanna play in a band and solidify, solidify myself as a musical artist? This would be the equivalent of an iOS developer going to a medium-sized company and just building the app, right? You're, you're kind of, you know, the joke with iOS development is like 90% of it is just hitting an API, parsing the JSON, making it look pretty on the screen, just doing pretty basic run-of-the-mill stuff. And you can make a great career out of that. That's not like knocking that at all. But for that, you probably don't need the computer you know, science theory. So again, where you do need it is, well, this is a long sentence, but he aspires to go beyond the mere title of a musical artist and be like a classical music, like a big deal. And how this ties into tech is, however, if you aspire to learn multiple platforms, uh, work in a global tech company, amazing salaries, blah, 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 here's the line I like, uh, who are at the top of their field, helping them literally define what tech is. Okay, if you're doing that, like, you know, if you're at Tesla, creating self-driving cars, or if you're in the AR field and you're defining the AR tech, one million percent, you're gonna to need to know the fundamentals of computer science theory, like inside and out. That's where those are important. So again, the distinction here, you can't really 
you know, put a whole blanket over everybody, right? What do you want to do? Are you just a hobbyist? Do you just want to work at a company where you're just building pretty standard iOS apps? Or do you want to define technology, right? So if you're in the first two camps, you probably don't need to understand all the computer science theory and all that stuff. And you can have great careers doing that. Again, not knocking it. However, if you want to go to these big companies and work on the cutting edge and define technology, then yes, the computer science fundamentals are going to be a paramount. But anyway, I highly recommend reading this article, especially if you're in the interview process and maybe you've had some of these whiteboard interviews as an iOS developer and you got all discouraged. I think this is a great article and a great point of view to help you understand the bigger picture on why these companies are asking these sort of questions. Up next, we have an article from John Sundell, uh, what role do tasks play within Swift's concurrency system? Now, if you've had a chance to play with the new async await in Swift 5.5, you've inevitably seen code like this, right? Where you create a task, put your async function in there, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, the most common way to use tasks is like I just said, is to have it act as a bridge between our synchronous main thread UI code, right? And any background operation. So it kind of acts like a bridge. And you'll notice, and he says it here too, like we're used to doing network calls where we have to capture, well, I'll go down to what he says here, right? Where you're, you're, you're capturing self, you're dispatching to the main queue for your uh, UI updates, any tokens or cancelables, right? There's a whole lot of what he calls bookkeeping that we normally do. The beauty about task is that when you use task in combination with, again, new in Swift 5.5, the new main actor, all of that kind of gets abstracted away and handled for you. That's one of the real benefits of this async await is using these tasks. So that's just the big picture, high level. As always, John goes much more in depth, you know, canceling a task, a whole bunch of stuff. So if you're just starting to dive into async await, or maybe you already have and you want a refresher, Understanding task is a big deal in this new async await world. So definitely check out this article from John to uh, get you up to speed. Next up, we have understanding Swift's async sequence from Donnie Walls. And I wanted to share this because, you know, there's a lot of questions with the new async await. Well, what about combine? Is combine dead? When should I use combine? When should I use async await? Well, first of all, if you really want to dive into that, he has a uh, post about that here, thoughts on combine in an async await world, which he links to. Uh, but we'll go back to this article because we talk specifically in this one about async sequence because async sequence is, you know, a stream of values kind of thing, uh, which is what combine does. So he talks here about, you know, when you would use async sequence, the pros and cons versus, you know, using that versus combine. So again, if you're really confused on, you know, async await versus combine, is combine dead? When should I use that? I think this is going to be a great article for you to check out. Next up, I wanted to share a Twitter thread from Koa here, uh, all about resources for Mac development, which I'm about to dive into uh, with Creator View. Uh, so this is bookmarked uh, for me for sure, but I wanted to share it for those reasons. So basically, how is it different uh, from all the other platforms? Uh, it gives that kind of overview. Of course, there's human interface guidelines for the Mac. That's a must read. And then creating a Mac OS app with SwiftUI. Apple has their own, you know, nice tutorial all about that. And then there's more, uh, you know, WWDC sessions. Uh, app Kit is done. I remember this article. I think I featured this on Swift News, uh, where someone went through and basically built an app in SwiftUI and talked about how it's really, really good. Uh, you can read that. And, and some of the issues they had between like App Kit and, and SwiftUI. Here's a bunch of like Mac developer blogs. So again, just uh, back to the Mac conference, a whole bunch of videos all about Mac development. So like I said, if you are thinking about diving into macOS development or you're about to, like I am, I think this is an invaluable thread that you should bookmark. Next up, we now have A-B testing on your product page on the App Store. What is A-B testing? Real quick, I know most of you probably know, but if you don't, it's basically where you can show two different treatments uh, for like advertising, if you will, right? Here's like the blue icon versus like more of a reddish icon. And you can see which gets more engagements, which gets more downloads. And obviously just changing the app icon is one. You can experiment with, you know, copy, text, all that stuff. Basically put up two product pages, let them run a test and see which one does better. And then you can choose that. And that's all now built right in um, to your app store page. You can go ahead and read this article all about it, but you get some uh, you know color scheme tests. So you can see how you can do treatment A and then the original product page. And then you can see, I'll scroll down here. They, they have some charts here, right? Yeah, some charts that are, uh, you know, treatment A is performing, you know, 1.9% better. You know, you can see like little details like that. Um, so you see you have treatment A, treatment B, treatment C, and you can see how they're all doing. So again, A-B testing built right into the App Store product page, good stuff. On to the design portion of the show. We have a Twitter thread from Jeff here. Tiny signs that to me show that an iOS app's probably being designed and engineered primarily for cross-platform, not like a native app. I see this all the time, it drives me nuts. 
although I'm a self-proclaimed Apple fanboy, so of course it does. So there's my bias, but uh, you can easily tell when there's like a cross-platform app. And I love this thread because Jeff points out a lot of them, right? Using other platforms, back buttons instead of the, the standard back Chevron. Uh, and I'm not saying the cross-platform is such a bad thing. And I do understand why designers would want to save time, right? One design for both platforms. You don't want to design two different apps. I get it. But if you're really going above and beyond, you know, you should try to make it look and feel as native uh, as possible. But again, I understand why people don't. Uh, non-standard custom icons for fairly common action patterns, right? Like this is not the more, right? Ours and iOS is horizontal, not vertical, right? This feels very Android-y or web app-y to me, right? And that's, that's the feeling you get when you're using these apps. It doesn't feel like native. Uh, standard system highlighting, he points out. Uh, I didn't know about this one, how you can select labels that should be static. Didn't know about all that. You know, if it's like a web thing. Uh, obviously you've seen, this drives me nuts. When I see like a table view that looks like this in like an iOS app, oh, oh, that's how I feel about it. Uh, anyway, just a, a nice thread on uh, basically pinpointing things that aren't native or even if they're built natively, they're not like design native. Um, again, like I said, I understand why people have to save time and resources and all that stuff, but you know, I, as a purist, I want, I want a pure native uh, experience. And finally, the LOL of the week, which isn't even that funny. It's just painful because I feel like we've all been there and we're like, yeah, that sucks. Uh, I'll just kind of read it real quick. Hey, I got to sign some bugs on the latest project, but there's no documentation. The developer's like, what? Of course there's documentation. There's definitely uh, a readme and then there's an explanation in Jira and there's probably something in Trello. Uh, and then there's also code comments. Long story short, the documentation is scattered between like six different resources, right? We've all been there. I'm sure we've all dealt with that. It's a headache to deal with. <laughs> and then she walks out and says, uh, okay, so exactly what I said, no documentation. Uh, yeah, more painful than funny, but wanted to share it. Uh, that wraps it up for this month's episode of Swift News. See you in the next one.